We're looking in uh, 1 John. If you'll find a Bible, you can turn to 1 John in the New Living Translation. If you don't have a copy, there's a, uh, one nearby, a brown Bible that you can pick up. What we're trying to do is to learn how to walk in the light. And we're learning the joy of fellowship in the light in order to be able to experience the joy that already belongs to the Father and Son. They've had this for eternity. It's the joy the apostles had with Christ. And it's the joy that we've been invited into uh, as Christians. It's the joy of being purified so that you'll be like the Son of God when He comes. It's the process God wants to do to take us from being sinners, children of the devil, to becoming children of God. Not just in name, but in the way we live. God wants us to live a holy life. Now, we're living a holy life in a world that hates us. Well, that's encouraging, wasn't it? But you need to know that. I ran across in my devotional reading this week, Psalm 112, and I want to just read a few verses from that. Praise the Lord. How joyful are those who fear the Lord and delight on obeying His commands. And then he drops down uh, in verse 9, he says, They share freely and give generously to those in need. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. They will have influence and honor. The wicked will see this and be infuriated. Wow, that was way back in olden times. They will grind their teeth in anger. They will slink away their hopes thwarted. One of the things that John wants us to understand is we're living in that kind of times. John, the people he was writing to in the first century were living in that kind of time. The wicked don't like to see the righteous prosper. They don't like to see Christians with influence. They don't like to see people who are doing what's right. The reason they don't like the light is because they love the darkness, because their deeds fit the darkness rather than the light. In walking in the light, we've been learning of many detours, uh, one of which was the detour of hate. That was in chapter 2. Well, we're kind of returning to that in chapter 3, verses 11 to 15, but I've called this one in particular the detour of envy. And I think you'll see as we go through, even though he doesn't use that word here, what's being described and what's being illustrated here is envy. We're encountering the envy of the world. We certainly don't want to encounter it in the church. The dictionary defines envy as being discontented or resentful, longing aroused by another's possessions, qualities, or luck. It's a form of hate, and it's the opposite of loving others when we're resentful of them or when we are envious of them. And starting down the road of envy will take us away from walking in the light, just as surely as any other sin we might commit. We need to be aware of that and be understanding of that. Now if you'll look in 1 John chapter 3 verses 11 to 15, we want to read the scriptures and it'll be on the screen. You can follow along. Uh, if you don't actually happen to have this particular version, uh, you can follow along as I read. He says, this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. We must not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and killed his brother. And why did he kill him? Because Cain had been doing what was evil, and his brother had been doing what was righteous. So don't be surprised, dear brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. If we love our brothers and sisters who are believers, it proves that we have passed from death to life. But a person who has no love is still dead. Anyone who hates another brother or sister is really a murderer at heart. And you know that no murderers, that murderers don't have eternal life within them. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you will indeed open our heart and mind, open our eyes, illumine us, Lord, to what you're saying to us today. Father, we know that you spoke this message to people a long time ago, Christians like ourselves. And Lord, even as we are maybe 20 centuries removed from them, the things that it speaks of are still true in our world today. Lord, we would ask that you might prepare us for living a Christian life in the light in our day through these words that we study today. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Envy is contrary to the Christian message. He said, this is the message you've heard from the beginning. What is it? We should love one another. We ought to love one another. The basic message of the gospel is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and from that, we could reasonably conclude God wants us to love one another. That's the message we ought to get from that. 
It is the logical outcome of the gospel that we love one another. He goes down in verse 16. He says this, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. We'll talk about that verse next week. There's a lot there. There's a lot of life transforming thing in that verse. But what he's saying is it's logical because of the way God has loved us for us to show that same kind of love to one another. And it's not just putting on love. It is a self-sacrificing love for the benefits of, one, of other people around us. Now to illustrate that, he goes negative. Political season, that kind of fits. You're going to have negative. Well, let's talk negative. Don't be like Cain. Remember Cain and Abel? Well, remember Cain. We don't remember a whole lot about Abel because Abel got killed. Cain killed Abel. But listen to what he says here. Why not to do that? We must not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and killed his brother. And why did he kill him? Because Cain had been doing what was evil. You need to understand that. Cain had adopted a pattern of life and said, I'm going to do what's the wrong thing. I'm going to do evil. And ultimately, he became envious because it says, and his brother had been doing what was righteous. John starts here with a terrible entering, a violent killing. The word literally is used sometimes of slaughter, bloodshed, just butcher house kind of blood. The killing of Abel by his brother Cain. What a horrible thing to have happen, particularly in a close family. The idea of being able to kill somebody in your family. Now, not by a show of hands, you probably have experienced that kind of rage. And it's probably been toward people in your family. You just kind of, you want to smack them. And Cain had that. It comes from deep within. Why did he kill his brother? Well, the answer should be obvious, but we often miss it in the stu our study of the Bible. He did it because evil hates righteousness. If you're going to live in this world, you got to understand that. you got to understand that people in the world who have been overcome by the evil one hate righteousness. They hate people that do what's righteous. They do not like righteous people. They hate them. They absolutely despise people that do this. He said, don't be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. Now, let's go back and let's look at what happened. Because oftentimes, I find when we, when we study Genesis 4, we miss out on, we get tied up in the offerings. And well, Cain brought this kind of offering, and Abel brought this kind of offering. And I think there's something we're missing there. So turn back to Genesis chapter 4. And I'm going to start in verse 3, and I'm going to read verses 3 through 5, and then we'll, we'll talk about that. I want you to notice, listen to what he says. When it was time for harvest, remember Cain was a farmer. He grew crops. Abel was a farmer. He raised animals. They both made their living farming. When it came time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. He's mentioned first. Abel also brought a gift. The best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. That is, the, the, the portions with the fat, it literally says. The best of that. Now notice, the Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. And this made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected, or his countenance fell, it says in the King James. You could tell, there was no secret about it, Cain is angry. But did you notice that it wasn't just the offering that was accepted and rejected? Look what it says. Abel brought a gift, and the Lord accepted Abel and his gift. And he rejected Cain and his gift. Now, it wasn't just rejected because of what was brought. I believe that God had not instructed them as to what it would take to satisfy him. I think God is teaching them and developing their understanding of what is it going to take to please God. What's it going to take to satisfy God? What's it going to take to make God in our favor, or as the word is, propitious towards us. What's it going to take to make God pleased with us? And there's a good word, pleased with us. We ought to be seeking to please God. What's it going to take? And God very clearly makes clear that it's not going to take some work of our hands, even if Cain had brought the very best of his crops. God was not going to accept that as the offering. Instead, he takes the offering of Cain, of Abel, and accepts that offering, which is a sacrifice. He brings a portion of the life of an animal, the meat of an animal. 
Now, you could conclude God likes barbecue, but how do you get barbecue? Kind of like the, uh, we're talking about the, the, the chicken and the pig talking about breakfast, and the chicken said, I make a contribution. The pig says, well, mine's a little more. You know, it takes a real sacrifice. What's God saying here? If sin's going to be paid for, something innocent is going to have to die in the place of the guilty, for the guilty to be able to come to God and to be pleasing to God. Here in the beginning, chapter 4, that's like four chapters in to Genesis, to, to the revelation of what he's explained to Israel. Remember, this was given to Israel to prepare them to go into the land where people were going to hate them. You need to understand sacrifice is going to be important. It's going to take, there's a sacrifice coming where an innocent is going to give his life in order to pay for the sins of the guilty so they can be accepted before God. And God is beginning to explain that. But he's got two different people here. One is Cain, who John lets us know is of the evil one. Satan has already dominated Cain and Abel. Abel is seeking to please God. He's seeking to uh, honor God. And Cain is not really seeking to please God or honor God. Now, if you wanted to please God and God said, I don't like that kind of sacrifice, what I really like, I don't like salad, I'd really like barbecue. What would you serve next time? Barbecue. Cain said, wait a minute, I ought to be accepted based on what I've done. His face fell. He got angry. He looked dejected. And uh, in, in Genesis chapter 4, God is explaining to him, you can't get a better counselor than God. And God takes it upon himself to confront Cain about what's going on. And he said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your face fallen? If you do well, that is, if you do good, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, here's the warning, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is to con contrary to you, is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. When we come to God, we have to come to God with nothing. We have to come to God and say, the only thing, God, I can offer you is what you have given in your son, Jesus Christ. That's what it's going to take to make things right between you and me. And we came to the place in our life where we realized there really was nothing we could do to make up for the sin we've already committed. There's nothing we can do really to purify ourselves. We're already so corrupted by sin. We're already so taken in by the idea that I want what I want that we're unfit to come to God and to worship God. We, we, we basically said to God, God, if you don't do something to change this, we're going to be as hopeless as Cain. And so by faith we came and said, Lord, in my hand no price I bring, simply to the cross I cling. And we recognize it's got to be God that does it. We're unable to do more than just to confess we're a sinner. We're looking to God to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're looking to God to make our lives better. Not so Cain. And then the Bible goes on to say that Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. Now, that's left a gap there. People have tried to fill in, well, what did he say? Basically, he lured his brother out into the field. I think Cain was speaking to his brother while there was hatred of his brother in his heart. He was fooling him so he could get him out there. And he got up and killed his brother. He slaughtered his brother, a violent, bloody death. Why? What had Abel done to Cain? Not a thing, right? Hadn't done a thing. All he'd done is do the right thing. He had worshiped God the right way, and that wasn't acceptable to Cain because Cain wanted his way to be the right way. There are people in this world that are going to get very upset with you when you tell them that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. They're going to say that can't possibly be true. There can't be one way to God. And our message is, yes, there is one way to God. It's not the way of love in the sense that you're going to love one. I'll just love everybody and be nice to everybody and I'll treat everybody well and I'll do love everybody and then God will accept me. No, God says that won't work. There's a problem inside of you. Sin is crouching at each of our heart's door. And its desire is not to do you good. Its desire is to get you to do as terrible a thing as it can possibly get you to do. Either by overtly murdering somebody or by simple neglect, we'll let somebody perish. And God says that's not going to work. That's not going to be the way it's done. I'm going to have to come in and do. It's going to have to be seen that it takes me in your life to make the change in your life. You're going to have to understand that I have to be involved in the process. Otherwise, you're going to be like Cain. 
and envy of the righteous is going to destroy you. Notice Cain and Abel were both very religious people. On his own, it's harvest time. I'm going to bring God an offering. I'm going to bring God an offering. I'm going to worship God. Abel also brought an offering. But it was Cain that was taking the lead. And yet Cain was not accepted. Why? Because there was something inside of Cain. The God who sees the heart said that won't work. That's the path away from the light. You're walking in darkness. You know, I can't tell by looking who's walking in the light and who's walking in darkness. Because I can't really see the heart. I, I can barely see some of you anyway. Uh, but, uh, but I can tell you're here. And if you're not here, uh, you've got deeper problems than that. But I can tell you're here. But it doesn't tell me whether you're walking in the light or walking in the darkness. Only God can see the heart. Now, eventually, we'll notice there was no question at the sacrifice who was accepted by God and who wasn't. And there was no question who was a person that loved his brother after Cain killed Abel. Everybody knew Cain is a horrible person. He's gotten controlled by sin. He's walking in darkness. And by the way, when you go on and read the rest of chapter 4, when you understand that, you'll notice that everything he did and everything he passed on was darkness. His whole line, they walked in darkness. They walked in selfishness. They walked without love for their brother. It was no problem to kill somebody. Whatever it takes for me to be on top, and I can't stand it when somebody else has the favor of God, has the blessing of God. That was their life. It destroyed Cain's life. John is saying in 1 John chapter 3, don't let this destroy your life. Don't be like Cain, because if we become like Cain, if we allow ourselves to live like Cain, we'll become the kind of, we'll commit the kind of acts that Cain committed. It didn't start on just that day. It had already begun. And because he did not heed the word of God and confess his sin and ask God to change him, he eventually wound up murdering his brother. When we tolerate evil in our lives, we become increasingly like the devil until the sin which is crouching at our door attacks and takes us. How do we avoid that detour? and those who are on it. Let me suggest some things. First in verse 14, we got to be converted and begin to act in love towards others. We need to be converted. Hear what I'm telling you. Nobody can straighten their life out in their own power. If you're dependent on you and your goodness, you're going to fail. If you're dependent on you and your wisdom and your intelligence and your strength and your desires. You say, I've got the best desires in the world. I really want to do good. I really want to be right. I really want to help others. Listen, there's a problem inside of you that will destroy you unless God gives you the victory over that. You've got to be converted. You've got to come to a place where you say, I put my trust in Christ. I've got to be saved. John 5, 24 says this. Truly, truly, I say to you, this is Jesus talking, Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Now, what's eternal life? Well, it's too simple to say eternal life goes on forever. Anybody here want to live forever in these bodies? No, he's talking about something else. He's talking about the life that God has. Did you hear what he said? Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has God's kind of life living in him. He's got eternal life. He's begun to live the life of forever, the life that God alone has. God is going to share his life with you. And all you got to do is hear the word and believe in God. When you hear what Jesus' message is and you put your trust, your faith in God, that's what believe means. You put your faith in God. You have eternal life and you will not come into judgment, but you have passed from death to life. It's not that I'm going to live eternally when I die. It's I'm already doing it now. I have passed from death into life. And all you had to do was trust God. You heard the word of God and you trusted God. God talked to us about our sin, just like he talked to Cain about his sin. And God offered him the way of salvation through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He offered him the warning, you need to change your way. Because if you keep on like you're going, you're going to lose. Sin will take you. We came to the place where we said, I hear what you're saying. And I believe God has come to save me. And I put my trust in him. First of all, you've got to be converted. But secondly, we've got to ask ourselves if when we find that we're not loving somebody else, particularly a brother or sister in Christ, you've got to ask yourself the question, why don't I love that person? Why is it hard for me to love that person? What is it about them? And of course, that's the way we think, right? It must be something about them. 
I mean, after all, I'm sweet and lovable. It must be them. You know, they've got a problem. And one of the first questions we ought to ask ourselves is, is it possible that I have not passed from death to life? You know, if you join a church, that doesn't mean you're saved. You can preach the gospel and not be saved. Have I really been converted? If I find that I'm not loving other believers, I need to go back and, and question, did I really get saved? Maybe I misunderstood the message. Maybe I thought the gospel was all about saving me, and one of these days, you know, God will save me and I'll have life forever, not recognizing that the message of the gospel is we ought to love one another. That if God loved me that much, then the only logical thing I could do is start loving other people. Yeah, maybe I missed that message. Maybe I thought salvation was like a fire insurance policy. I'll get it in case I, I were to die and they might want to send me to hell. I said, wait a minute, I got a policy. I got an escape clause. No, no, no. God wants to give you not escape from hell, but eternal life. He wants you to live with him. He wants you to live his life. Maybe you missed that. Rather than coming to the place where you put your trust in Christ, you said, hey, I'll take what you're offering, but I'm going to live my life my way. It's all about me. And sometimes we have to think back, and there are, it's possible that you have never been saved. And that's the reason you don't love other believers. But a second thing, could it be that you're holding on to envy? One of the things, one of the messages in 1 John is, that we need to understand is it's telling us there are things that we do that we think are okay. I mean, there's sins we want to get rid of, and there's sins we think, well, you know, that one's not so bad. That's, that's not, I mean, there are some really terrible, I mean, murdering somebody else, that's a really terrible thing. But being envious of what people have, I, I can manage that because I, I, could, I could go out and work and get what they've got maybe. Uh, maybe I could, you know, sometimes we hold, have you held on to the sin of envy and said, I, I'm envious of so-and-so, but I don't want God to take that out of my life yet. I don't want to confess, I don't want to confess that that's the same thing as murder because I don't think it is. I don't think it's as, as bad as murder. Surely that's not it. Cain's problem led to murder. If he had dealt with it back here, he wouldn't have slaughtered his brother out in the field. Am I holding on to envy like that's okay? It's a minor thing. We won't worry with it. When God is confronting us and saying that envy's got to go, I want to clean up that envy in your life. It's going to ruin your life. Sin, the sin of envy is crouching at your door, and its desires are contrary to what you want. You don't want to go down that path, but if you don't watch what you're doing, it'll take you. And then the third question I thought of in terms of this, if I'm not loving others, why? Is it not true that when I'm envious of others, I'm trusting me instead of God? I'm not really trusting God. I'm thinking that, you know, if other people are getting praise and honor and glory and they're, they're being successful, I need to reorchestrate my career. Maybe I'm not doing what's right. Maybe I need to change up and, and you know, I need to do this. Uh, there are pastors that have book deals and they sell millions of books. I mean, they're pastors that make millions. They're pastors that they teach in, in seminaries. They go on the lecture circuit. Uh, they've got this, they've got that. It's, it's possible even, I know this is a shock, but it's possible for even pastors to be envious. See, I told you you wouldn't believe it. But, I mean, it can happen. And you know what happens when you get in that situation, you're trusting yourself, and you think, I'm the one that's got to direct it, instead of recognizing God gives you what he wants you to have. If God had wanted to praise, Abel, praise Cain, he could have done that but he was not favorable towards Cain. And that's God's choice. And he invites Cain to trust him and he'll do what's right. If you'll do well, you'll be pleased, you'll be honored. I find when I am envious of others, it's because I'm, I'm dependent on me instead of dependent on God. Maybe when you look at your envy, you'll see that might be part of the problem too. I'm thinking I'm the one that's gotta do this and I'm the one, instead of recognizing it's God, let him do what he wants to do. God wants to accept this sacrifice, that's God's to do. God wants to direct my life this way, then that's the way God wants to direct my life. Let me do that instead of, I might have to humble myself and go to Abel and buy a sheep, and I don't want to do that. Not trusting God is a lot of the root of most of our sins. We're trusting ourselves instead of Him. Third thing I thought about, we must be prepared to confess our unrighteousness and to change as the Lord confronts us as He did Cain. The Bible says, 1 John 1, 9, I'm sure you've heard it before. If not, you're going to hear it several more times before we get out of 1 John. If we confess our sins, that's all God asks us to do. If we confess our sins, if we say to God, God, I've got this, I've done this terrible thing. I want to confess to you that I've allowed this sin in my life. I've got this sin of envy in my life. God says, good, I'll take it from there. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. 
Therefore, he will cleanse us. He'll forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God said, not only have you got a problem with envy, but you've got a problem. You hate your brother. And I want to take care of that too. Okay, God, you clear it up. Because I just want to let you know, I, I've tried. I can't do it. God, show me what I need to know. Teach me what I need to believe. Show me Christ as he really is in order that I might make the changes necessary. I think, God, if you'll change my thinking, it'll change my actions. But, God, you're going to have to do it. That's what confession is. God, I don't want this in my life, but I find myself powerless to get out of it. God, help. God says, I I'll do it. We have an advocate. Chapter 2, verse 2 says, with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is our, what's the H word? Helasmos. He's the propitiation. He is the one who satisfies the wrath of God. He's the one pleading for us. When we confess, we're on the road to making the changes in our life. Cain wouldn't confess. He didn't confess that he'd done the wrong thing. And even when God confronted him after he'd murdered his brother and the blood of his brother had soaked into the ground, he said, am I my brother's keeper? I don't know where he is. Sure you know. He, he killed him. He didn't walk off. You know where his blood is. God says, I hear his blood crying out from the ground. We've got to confess and we've got to say that is not what I want in my life. I don't want to be an unrighteous person. And I certainly don't want to be a kind of person that would murder somebody else, slaughter somebody else in rage, in my anger against them. God says, if you don't deal with the sins I'm pointing out to you now, if you don't confess those to me, that awaits you. It's coming. It's within you. We have to recognize how dangerous sin is. Child of God is as dangerous for us as it is for people in the world. Christians can do these sins. If we don't walk with God, we don't abide in Christ, it can happen to us because the same sin that's in them is still in us. And only God can give you the power to overcome it. Fourth thing I thought about in terms of this. In verse 13, we must not let opposition, envious hatred by the world surprise us. Surprise us. Don't let that happen. The world is going to hate you. Don't let that surprise you. What's he mean by that? Somebody hates me, I hate them back. I'm not really expecting, I really am a lovable person. And I'm, I, it always surprises me when people don't like me. It's like, really? I thought you were talking about so-and-so. It's me? Oh, I, I didn't, you know, you, something wrong with you because I'm delightful. And then you get to say, well, fooey on you. If that's your attitude, I don't need you. You see, we tend to react to hate instead of responding to hate. Child of God, you need to understand you're going to get hated in this world for doing the right thing. There are people in this world that cannot stand the fact that you did the right thing. You're doing the right thing. They are figuring out some way to get what you've got. Whether it's honor, money, adulation, whatever it is, they don't like that. Power, we want to take away power from you. We don't want you to be the ones running things because if you're running things, you're going to be like Daniel and you'll be the model and anybody, anything, we can't live up to that. That's why they cast Daniel in the lion's den because they knew there's no way we can get him. He's so powerful. He's so mighty. He's so honest. He's so good. It's keeping down the graft and corruption. We're not making any money because everybody says, why can't you be like Daniel? You know, he's the standard. We're going to put Daniel over everybody and Daniel, well, he knows what you're doing and we don't want that because it's hard to get rich that way. You see, the world will hate you. They're going to despise you in school. They're going to despise you on the job because you're not going to be the one that sneaks off. You're going to be the one that works till it's time to quit. You're going to be the one that gets the job done. You're going to be the kind of person that takes care of your wife, looks after your children. They can't stand that because it makes their sin look so much worse. You're not going to be the person throwing up in the gutter or landing in jail with them. And they're going to hate you for that. Hey, you're no friend of mine. A good friend of mine would be right there in jail beside me. We don't want you. He said, don't let that throw you. Recognize and understand that you're going to be hated in this world. Don't be surprised by that. Don't let it throw you off to where you start taking punches back. Just recognize that's the path the Savior has set them on. Jesus said, they've hated me. You know why they're going to hate you? Because they hate me. And when they see you, they see me. You need to brace yourself for that and understand that. Pontius Pilate said this about Jesus, or they, he concluded this about Jesus. He knew very well that the religious leaders had arrested Jesus out of envy. He was getting the crowds. He was winning over the people. He was becoming popular and they couldn't stand it. When the apostles were brought before the Sanhedrin, Acts 5, 17, the high priest and his officials who were Sadducees were filled with jealousy because the gospel message was spreading. 
When you are being hated by the world, you're in company with the Savior. You're in company with the apostles. You may even be in the company of the martyrs. Revelation chapter 6 verse 9 uses this word. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of all who have been martyred for the word of God and for being faithful in their testimony. That's what we want to be, faithful. John chapter 3 verses 14 and 15 let us know that hatred will lead to murder. If we love our brothers and sisters who are believers, it proves we pass from death to life. It's an assurance to us. You're on the way. You've succeeded. You have, you have got eternal life. And that's what's causing you to love other believers. But a person who has no love is still dead. Verse 415 says, And anyone who hates another brother or sister is really a murderer at heart. And you know that murderers don't have eternal life within them. They are contradictory. I want to encourage you today. If you're loving other believers, know that this is God's sign of assurance to you that I have worked this in your heart. I've given you eternal life. I've given you my love to shed abroad to others. If you're having trouble, if you're having difficulty loving somebody in this room, know that sin is crouching at your door and it has not got your best interest at heart. God wants you to deal with that envy. God wants you to deal with that problem. God wants you to recognize, if I don't deal with this, I could wind up killing somebody. Choose whether you want to walk in darkness or walk in light. Didn't you make the decision, I want to walk in light? Then we ought to walk in the light as he is in the light. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we have put our trust in you. Lord, we've made the declaration that we want to come to the light so that our own deeds of darkness, our own sins might be exposed. Lord, not just to the world, but Lord, be shown to us that, hey, we have a problem that's far greater than we thought. But Lord, we thank you that in your love, not only did you send your son to die for us, but Father, you have saved us and put your Holy Spirit within us to point out to us the things that have got to change. Lord, as your children... We want to make those changes. Lord, we don't want it to be said of any of us, this one murdered his brother, as was said of Cain. Rather, we want it to be said, behold how they love one another. Lord, whatever changes you have to make in my heart and in my life to bring that about, I ask you to do it for Jesus' sake. Lord, if there's someone here this morning that's yet to put their trust in Christ, yet to take that first step of walking in the light, confessing that they are a hopeless sinner, And without you, God, they will wind up killing somebody, doing something so awful and terrible that it's painful to speak of. Lord, I pray that you'll open their heart and mind to faith even at this moment. They'll plead with you for salvation. Father, we know that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, that they'll ask, and Father, that you'll save them. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ and for his glory. Amen.